Hey, what's up everybody? This is CLS All-in-One. In today's video, I will be demonstrating a shower remodel, showing all the steps from start to finish, including plumbing, framing, patching, caulking, painting, and much more. The new shower I installed comes in a kit made by Lions Industries from the Lions Linear product line, which has kits available in multiple different sizes and configurations. This shower measures 48 inches wide by 34 inches deep by 74 inches high and consists of three shower surround panels, a shower base, and a glass sliding door. The shower walls and base feature an ultra gloss acrylic surface, which is super easy to clean, and they are reinforced with fiberglass, which makes them super durable. The walls also include some very handy built-in shelves and even a step, and the shower base has a nice textured surface to keep you from slipping and a square drain opening for a more modern look. The glass doors seem to be very sturdy and feature one quarter inch tempered glass with an aqua vanish surface to protect it from water spots. Overall, the quality of this kit seems to be great. Everything feels very sturdy and solid, which means this should last for a very long time. Since this is a shower remodel, there's a lot of different steps involved and not every job is the same. So some of the steps involved with my remodel may not apply for yours, but I will try to cover as much as possible throughout this video. The old shower is only three foot wide. So this means I'll have to make the opening one foot wider to accommodate for the new larger shower that is four feet wide, which will involve moving a shower wall and rerouting the plumbing and drainage and I will also have to modify a cabinet to accommodate for the new wall location. And since this existing shower is a one piece design, it will have to be cut in multiple pieces in order to remove it. So let's get started. And I will begin with removing all the baseboards surrounding the shower. So the wall on the left side of this cabinet contains the plumbing, and this is the wall that will have to be moved one foot over. But first I will have to either remove this cabinet or modify it which is what I will be doing. So right here, I'm marking the cabinets in an area where they can be cut in half and still be functional. We really liked having the storage space, but ultimately, we decided we'd rather have a larger shower, so this cabinet needs to be downsized. Now, since this is a very custom modification that will probably not apply to most remodels, I will not go into great detail about this process, but basically what I did is I just measured and marked where I wanted to cut the cabinets, then used a sawzall and a multi-tool to make the cuts. And of course, it would probably be better just to buy a whole new cabinet that fits the new wall location perfectly, but cabinets are expensive, so I will make this work. Now at this point, I will stop working on the cabinet, but later on in the video, I will end up putting a new end cap on the left side of it and paint the cabinet as well. And now I have plenty of room to work with the shower wall that contains the plumbing, so I will now mark and cut the wall to make an opening to access the plumbing. And as you can see here, there is some mildew inside this wall that will have to be treated, and some of this drywall will need to be replaced. Now it's time to cut the water lines to the shower so the shower wall can be moved, but first the water to the house will need to be shut off. And if the lines are made of pecs like mine, they can be cut from up above, then pulled through from underneath the home or basement. But if they are made out of a rigid material such as copper, they will need to be cut from underneath with a pipe cutter. Then the water lines can be temporarily capped off from underneath with a fitting such as this shark bite brass end stop that works on both copper and PEX lines, which just pushes right onto the end of the cut line. And now that the water lines are capped off, I can go ahead and turn the water back on to the house. Now I will begin removing the shower starting with the door, and this just has a couple screws on the top and bottom. Next, the plumbing fixtures can be removed. So I'll go ahead and remove the shower head first. Then the shower head arm can be removed. And next, I will remove the cutoff water lines from the back of the faucet. Then begin removing the shower faucet. Now this is kind of a weird faucet assembly for a shower because it's designed like a kitchen faucet. It has just two nuts on the back to secure it in place. And most of your standard faucets are secure from the front side with the handle and trim plate. But whatever faucet style you do have, they're usually fairly easy to take apart. 
so sometimes the shower surrounds are finished with drywall at the edges. And this requires using a multi-tool or sawzall to cut around the outer perimeter of the shower to expose the edges. But with other showers, the edges may be covered with trim as shown here. And this trim is just secured with screws, so it's fairly easy to remove. After removing the trim, there's also some screws that secure the edges of the shower to the wall, and these will also have to be removed. And as you can see here, the shower is now loose, but because this was installed before any of the interior walls were put up, this will not fit through the doorway, so I will have to cut this down into multiple pieces. So right here I'm using a sawzall to make my cuts, but you'll want to be very careful when making cuts like this. You'll want to cut as shallow as possible because there may be some water lines or electrical lines or other utilities located right behind the shower wall. So what I've done here is I've cut it into three pieces and that'll make it a lot easier to fit out of the doorway. Now this half is ready to take out. And the other half I got to finish my cut here. And now this can be removed. And now the bottom, I have a little bit more work to do before I can get this out of here. I'll have to cut the drain away from the shower pan. And I could also go underneath and take this apart as well, but this is easier just to cut from the top side. So I'm just about done here and the shower pan is now loose and ready to be removed. So this was in here pretty tight, so it did take a little effort to get it out of here. And here's a look at the opening after removing the shower enclosure. So it's pretty dirty, it will need to be cleaned up. And now I'm gonna go ahead and cut the rest of the drain here to where it's flush with the top of the floor. And I will have to relocate this as well at a later point. But right now I'm gonna concentrate on moving the wall to where it needs to be, which is gonna be about a foot over from where it is right now. So currently, the opening for the shower measures at 36 inches wide, and the new shower requires the frame opening to be at 48 inches wide. So I will measure and mark where the wall needs to be moved to. And it looks like there is a couple layers of flooring that's on top of the original floor that will have to be cut away in order to move the wall to the new location. To remove the vinyl flooring, I used a straight edge and a utility knife, and to remove the laminate, I used a multi-tool. Now I will cut the nails or screws at the top and bottom and sides of the wall. And to do this, I'm using a sawzall with a long blade. And it may be somewhat of a tight fit, so you can use a pry bar such as this to get underneath of the wall and then make your cuts. And right here at the top of the wall, I do have some trim to remove before I make my cuts. And this part gets a little messy here. But I just have to locate where all the nails and screws are and get those cut so the wall becomes loose just like this. And now I will use a hammer to tap the wall over at the top and bottom and get this wall into position. And here's a look at the new wall location. And as you can see, I did scar up the ceiling a little bit there, but I can patch that up later, no problem. Now this wall is still loose and it will have to be secured. But first I'm gonna go ahead and strip the drywall on the inside of the shower opening. So on the walls where the drywall is in good condition, I decided to just measure where the shower surround will be located. Then I added a couple extra inches and made my cuts. But this method requires the drywall to be patched back in, which I will demonstrate. But since the drywall on the wall that I moved is in poor condition, I will just be removing it from top to bottom, then replace it around the shower edges after the shower walls are installed, which I will demonstrate as well. And now I will go ahead and level and plumb the wall that was moved and secure it with some long screws on the top, side, and bottom. And this step may require some extra framing in the ceiling and wall in order for the screws to have something solid to attach to. Now I will go ahead and treat any mildew inside the shower opening with a mildew cleaner such as bleach water. Right here I'm using a spray bottle with 25% bleach and 75% water to thoroughly spray the mildew areas. Then I will scrub and repeat the process until clean, then use a fan to thoroughly dry it out. So here's a look at the instructions for the framing stud layout, which shows the required stud locations and the suggested stud locations. So basically it calls for studs being located in all four corners with some extra support in between. Now when you're dealing with a remodel such as mine, 
it may be easier to install the boards in a different direction to avoid rerouting any wires or plumbing that may already be in the wall, as shown here. So right here, I'm installing a 2x4 for the corner of the shower and using two screws to secure it at the bottom. Now I will grab a level and ensure the board is plumb. And since there is some drywall covering the top of this board, I did take some measurements to know exactly where the top plate of this wall is, then made some marks on the face of the wall, then toenailed two screws through the drywall and 2x4 into the top plate. And right here, I'm adding another stud and securing it by toenailing it with screws at the top and bottom. And the purpose of this stud is to provide extra support between the corners. And here is a look at the back wall where a modification had to be made to the framing. So I actually had to cut a 2.5 inch deep chunk out of this existing 2x6 stud with a sawzall to allow for the shelving pockets on the shower wall to fit in this area. But since I did cut this board, that did take away some of the structural support. And that's why I added an extra stud on the left side. The stud that was cut could have just been removed, but I chose to keep it in place because it's an exterior wall stud that has siding attached to it on the other side, so it still has a function. After getting the framing in order, it's time for a quick test fit. So I'm going to grab the shower base and put that in place. Then the back shower wall. And with this panel, I'm trying to make sure that these shelves fit properly without hitting any of the studs. And to temporarily hold the panel in place, I'll use a screw with a washer. And this will keep the panel from falling over. Now I'll grab the left side panel and put that in place. And that just pushes into the back panel. And you do want to make sure that, that back panel is centered. Now I'll grab the right side panel and slide that in position. And usually when you put the second panel in place, it is a little bit tighter fit. So both the shower panels and base have a blue protective plastic film on them to protect them. And I will leave this film on until the end of the install. So the purpose of this test fit is to ensure that everything fits correctly and that the wall studs are in the correct locations. So we got a couple studs here at the edges. We got a couple in the middle. We got some here in the corner. And for a little extra support, I also added some blocking to this area right here for the edge of the shower. Then we have a couple more in the middle of this panel, including the two by six that I did have to cut a chunk out of for the shelves to fit in correctly. Then there's a couple more studs here in the corner and some on the edges over here as well. Now I will use a pencil and mark the opening for the drain on the shower base. Then remove the shower wall panels in the base. Now I will use a jigsaw to cut an opening for the drain. And you may need to drill a half inch hole first so the jigsaw blade has a starting point. And the hole should be cut slightly larger than the outline of the drain, so it ends up being approximately a six inch square. And here's what it looks like from the bottom side. So basically what I need to do is reroute the drainage to the new hole which will involve cutting the drain pipe, then rerouting it through the floor joist. Then I will line it up with the new hole. And to cut the pipe, I did use a multi-tool, which worked good. Now I will have to use some elbows to make it through the floor joist, but first I will need to drill a hole, and I will use a hole saw bit that measures two and a half inches, which is slightly larger than the outside diameter of my drainage pipe. And here's a look at the hole where the drainage will be rerouted through. So I'll test fit a couple sweeps on here and see if they fit through the floor joist as they should. So I'll attach this end first, then attach another one from the other side. And as you can see here, I'm now through the floor joist and I'll wait to glue these together until I get all the other fittings in place. Next, I will use some all purpose cement and primer to glue some of the other fittings. The first fitting is a color made of PVC that will need to be primed first on both ends. Then it will need a short amount of time to dry before applying the glue. With black ABS fittings such as this drain trap, no primer is necessary, just glue. So right here, I'm applying a liberal coat of glue to the inside of this fitting. Then I will apply a coat of glue to one side of the PVC collar, then push the two pieces all the way together with a twisting motion. Now normally, you will want to stick with the same type of pipe for your drainage system. But in some situations, ABS and PVC can be mixed together with the correct glues and primers as shown here. And to cut your pipe, you can use a hacksaw or a compound saw, which works really well. Now that I have the trap glued together, I will head back underneath and center the trap with the new hole. 
Then measure the distance from the trap to the elbow sweeps. Then cut a piece of pipe to go between them. Then glue everything together. And here's a look at the drainage after getting everything in place. So here's the shower drain I will be using, which consists of a base plate that mounts up against the bottom of the shower base, a top plate that mounts on the inside of the shower base, and a square drain strainer that mounts to the top plate. So for right now, I will just be installing the base plate, and the rest of the drain will be assembled later on after the shower base is installed. So the drain itself is made of PVC, so I did have to apply some primer to that, as well as the collar. Now I will apply some glue to the ABS pipe, and some glue to the collar as well. Then add some more glue to the top side of the collar, and some glue to the inside of the drain. Then I will press and twist these two pieces together. And this will be the stopping point for the drain assembly, until later on when the shower base is in place. Now it's time to patch the hole in the floor from the previous drain location. So I have cut a small square out of a scrap piece of plywood that is the same thickness as my set floor, then traced an outline around it onto the floor, then used a jigsaw and a multi-tool to make my cuts. Now I will use another piece of plywood with the same thickness and cut it at least 2 inches wider in both directions, then stick it through the hole at an angle, and to hold it in place you can drive a screw into the middle of it and this will act as a good handle to hold it in place while driving screws around the outside edges of the hole into this piece of plywood. So at this point what I've done is I've secured this piece of plywood to the subfloor with screws about every 3 inches around the perimeter of the hole. And now I will use this construction adhesive and apply a bead to the edges of the subfloor and some to the top of the plywood as well as some on the top of the floor joist. Then press the piece of plywood I traced earlier into this opening. Then I will apply more adhesive to the edges as shown here. Then secure this piece of plywood to the other piece of plywood with some screws, about every 3 inches. Then I will use a putty knife to spread the adhesive as evenly as possible around the patch. And since this adhesive happens to be pretty thick, I can also use it to patch small holes such as these 3 quarter inch holes where the water lines used to run through. Now it's time to reroute the water lines that I have capped off underneath the home to the new wall location. In this picture shown here, the red dots represent where the water lines would normally get routed. Basically, you want your plumbing to pop up through the floor directly under where the shower faucet will be located or very close to that area which usually involves drilling through the bottom plate of the wall. But with my setup, I do happen to have a small gap between the cabinet and shower wall, so to make things a little easier, I will go ahead and route the water lines right next to the wall instead, as shown here with the red dots. To drill through the floor, I will use a 3 quarter inch spade bit and make a hole for each water line. Next, it's time to turn the water off again. Then I will remove the shark bite brass end stops that I installed earlier to cap off the water lines with the use of this shark bite removal tool, which simply just pushes up against the end of the shark bite fittings to remove them. And at this point, the water lines may need to be extended to reach the new wall location, and this can be done easily with shark bite couplers such as this one. With this coupler, I'm able to join two water line ends together in just a matter of seconds. Now it's time to push the water lines through the holes I drilled earlier in the floor. But first, I'll make sure to tape off the end of the pipes to keep any contamination from getting inside the water lines. So right here, I'm pushing the water lines up through the holes I just drilled earlier. So here's the first water line, and here is the second. Now I will remove the tape off the end of the line, then go ahead and install a cap back on the end of both of these. And this step is optional, but I wanted to get the water turned back on as soon as possible, so that's why I chose to go ahead and cap these back off. So now that I have the plumbing in place for the shower wall, it's time to start installing the shower faucet. So this is a Moen Brooklyn shower faucet, which features a shower head with a magnetic base for the wand, which is a pretty cool feature. Now let's quickly take a look at some of the contents inside the box. This is the shower valve assembly, which controls the water pressure and temperature for the shower. Here is the shower head that has the magnetic base for the shower wand. And this also has a lever on the side of it, which controls the water flow for the shower head and shower wand. 
And now let's move on and start putting this together. So on this valve assembly, there is a top and bottom, and the top on this has a marking of up. So this should point towards the shower head. And located at the bottom of this valve is what supplies the water to the tub faucet. But since there is no tub, this end will be capped off with the supplied cap. To install this, I will use some Teflon paste to coat the threads first, then hand tighten the cap. Then use a pair of channel lock pliers to hold the valve assembly in place while using a wrench to tighten the cap. The threaded fittings will need to be tight, but not super tight. Now I will install some shark bite elbows that will need to face towards the floor to line up with the water lines. So same thing here, I coated the threads first with some Teflon paste, then hand tightened the elbows, then used some channel lock pliers to hold the valve in place while tightening with a wrench. So this part can get a little tricky because you want to make sure the elbows end up pointing in the right direction, but you will also want to make sure not to over tighten. So here is a look at what I've done so far. I installed a cap at the bottom and two elbows for the hot and cold water lines. And now I have one fitting left to install on the valve assembly. This is also a shark bite fitting, which has threads on one side. And this end here on the shower valve is what supplies water to the shower head. So all my fittings are now in place for this valve assembly. And it's now time to install this on the shower wall. The valve also comes supplied with a plaster ground, which can be used for installation and alignment. And for some thin wall showers where there is no support for the valve, this can also be used as a support. Now this next step is not required, but I usually like to add a support, so the valve assembly has something to attach and secure to. So first I'll mark the height where I want the valve to be located, and usually you want your valve to be about 4 feet high. Now I will use a 1x4 with some metal brackets and attach it between the studs at the height I just marked with the back of this 1x4 being even with the back of this wall. Then I will measure and mark where I want the valve to be centered from side to side, which for my shower is about 16 and 3 quarters of an inch from the corner. Next, I will use two short screws to secure the valve to the board through the non-threaded holes on the valve assembly. So this 1x4 works well for proper placement and support for this valve, but in some situations you may need to use the plaster ground to determine the proper placement for the valve and you may also need to use it for support. Now the elbow for the shower head arm can be installed. This is also a shark bite fitting with threads on one side and flanges to secure it. And just like the shower valve, I also installed a board going across to mount this too. As far as the positioning goes, the shower head should be centered with the shower valve, and the height should be somewhere around 71 and a half inches. And for right now, I will just secure this elbow with one screw because I will have to remove it here in just a few. Now I will connect this elbow to the shower valve with a piece of PEX pipe. So with the standard shark bite fittings, the insertion depth is around 15 sixteenths of an inch. So if you want to, you can pre-mark the pipe ends to know exactly how far to push it into the fittings. Now the other end of this pipe can be connected to the top of the valve, but this fitting is a shark bite max, so the insertion depth on this one is 1 inch. So I will make a mark 1 inch past the tip of this fitting, then cut the pipe. Then remove the one screw on the elbow at the top, then insert this end of the pipe into the shark bite max fitting with an insertion depth of 1 inch. Then re-secure the elbow with three screws. Now it's time to connect the water lines at the bottom of this wall to the shower valve, so the water to the house will need to be shut back off. Now I will grab a piece of PEX pipe and connect that to the elbow on the shower valve, and make sure it's long enough to reach the water line coming out of the floor. Then I will remove the brass end stop off the end of the hot water line, then use a shark bite max coupling to connect the two water lines together. So right here I'm pushing the coupling onto the red pipe approximately one inch. Then I'll take the white pipe and make a measurement approximately one inch past the tip of the shark bite max fitting. Then cut the pipe. Then insert this end into the shark bite max fitting with an insertion depth of one inch. So the hot water line should connect to the left side of the valve and the cold water line should connect on the right side of the valve. 
and now I will pretty much repeat the same process for the cold water side here. So I'll remove the brass end stop, then install a shark bite max fitting, then grab a piece of PEX pipe and insert that into the shark bite max fitting. And that goes in about one inch. Then I'm going to hold this up to the elbow up here and measure and cut approximately 15 16 of an inch past the tip of the elbow fitting here. Then insert this end of the pipe into the standard shark bite fitting approximately 15 16 of an inch. And now I will add one more support towards the bottom here to help hold the water lines in place a little better. So for this, either a 1x4 or 2x4 will work. And to secure this support, I just went ahead and toenailed some screws at the top and bottom. Now I will use a couple U-straps to secure the water lines to the back of this board. And now it's time to turn the water back on for a test. And you'll want to make sure that that water is in the off position on the shower valve. Otherwise, you're going to have a big mess. So now at this point, it's time to check for leaks. So what you want to do is check all the fittings and make sure there's no leaks. And luckily for me, I don't see any issues with my plumbing and all the fittings are bone dry. But if you do happen to have a leak, it may be because one of the pipes is not inserted far enough or one of the fittings may need tightened more. And now that my plumbing is done, I can go ahead and install an end cap panel on my cabinet by securing it to the edges of the cabinet and the side of the shelving with a small air stapler. So to fill the gap between the cabinet and wall, I will use this custom cut filler board. And to secure this board to the cabinet, these three inch cabinet screws work well. And I will be painting the cabinet as well as the filler board at a later point, so everything will match eventually. Now it's finally time to install the shower base. So right here, I'm peeling away the protective plastic film, but only from the edges for now. Next, I will use some rubbing alcohol and a rag to wipe off all the feet on the bottom of the shower base. Next, I will use some construction adhesive and apply a small bead of adhesive to the left and right side of each foot. Now, I will carefully lower the shower base into its correct position. And what I'm trying to do is stamp the floor with the adhesive I just applied to the feet. Then I will carefully lift the shower base back up. And as you can see on the floor, there's dots that indicate where the feet made contact with the floor. So now I'll use a pencil to make a circular outline and this will indicate where the adhesive needs to be applied for the feet. And that's what I'm doing right here. I'm applying a very liberal coat of adhesive to all areas where the feet make contact with the floor. Next, I will carefully lower the shower base back to the floor. Now in some situations, if the floor is very unlevel, you may have to add some shims under some of the feet to make contact with the floor. Now it's time to secure the flanges of the shower base to the walls. And for this, I'm using a countersink bit to pre-drill the holes first. Then I'll use some screws along with some shims to secure the flange at each stud location. And during this process, you'll want to be careful not to over tighten the screws because you may end up ripping through the flange with the screw. So just make sure to get the screws snug. And once the flange is secured to the wall, you can go ahead and cut off the excess shims. So the shower base is now installed and ready for the shower walls. So I will begin peeling off some of the plastic on the edges of the shower walls as well. And the reason I'm leaving the plastic in the middle of the panel still is I'm trying to protect it during the rest of the installation process. And now it's time to test fit the panels once again. So I'll put the back panel back in place, then one of the side panels, and then this last panel is going to require some holes to be cut for the plumbing. So right here, I'm measuring the distance from the back wall panel to the center of the valve and shower head. And I'm also measuring the distance from the edge of the shower base up to the center of the shower valve and another measurement from the edge of the shower base up to the center of the shower head. Then I use these measurements to mark exactly where the plumbing fixtures are located on the shower panel. 
Now I will use a two and a half inch hole saw bit to drill a hole for the shower valve. Then I'll use a one inch hole saw bit to drill a hole for the shower head. Then test fit the shower panel to make sure everything fits correctly. So now that I have all the panels in place and exactly where I want them, I will use a countersink bit to drill two holes in the back panel and secure it temporarily with two screws and this will mark the current position of the panel. So when I do install this for the final time, I will be able to put this panel in the exact same place. And now I will go ahead and remove all the shower panels once again. So I'll remove the side panels first, then take the two screws out of the back panel and remove that as well. And it'd also be a good idea to mark the top of the panels with a pencil, and this will let you know exactly where the shower panels end. That way you know how far to apply the adhesive on the walls. Now I will use some rubbing alcohol and a rag and thoroughly wipe off the back of the shower wall panels. And I will also wipe off all the areas on the wall where the shower surround will be making contact with. Then on the front side of the panels, I will use a small amount of rubbing alcohol and a rag and clean just the edges. Now I will separate the gaskets that come supplied with this kit by tearing them down the middle, then apply one on each side of the back wall panel. So these gaskets create a watertight seal between the back shower panel and the side shower panels when installed correctly. Next, I will apply a thick bead of construction adhesive to the face of the studs on the back wall in all the locations where the shower panel will make contact with. And at this point, you will want to work as fast and efficient as possible because we have to get all these panels up and in place and braced before the adhesive starts to set. So right here, I'm setting the back panel in place and lining it up with the two holes that I drilled earlier. Then I'll secure it with the two screws. Then I will firmly press on the panel in all areas where the studs are located to press the panel into the adhesive. Next, I will start applying a thick bead of adhesive on the wall for the left shower panel. Then carefully place the left shower wall panel into position. And once again, firmly press on the panel in all areas where the studs are located to press this into the adhesive. Then I'll repeat the same process on the right side. So I'll apply a thick bead of adhesive to the studs, then place the shower wall panel into position, then firmly press it against the studs. Now it's time to quickly secure the panels. To do this, I'll use a countersink bit to pre-drill the holes in the flange first, then use one and a quarter inch long screws to secure the panels to the wall and the panels should be secured with screws at every stud location. And on the front edges of the side panels, they should be secured with a screw wherever there is a dimple located on the flange, which is about every 14 inches. And once again, you want to be careful not to over tighten the screws on the flange because those screws could pop through. So just make sure to get the screws snug and not over tighten them. Now this next step is not always necessary, but if you're dealing with walls that are not perfectly plumb with each other, you may need to add some bracing to the shower walls to hold the panels in place until the adhesive dries. For this, some scrap 2x4s will work well. You can start with making a brace between the side panels that pushes up against the shower walls where the studs are located. Then you can build a brace off of this to the back wall and you can also use the inside edge of the shower pan to brace against as well. And here is a closer look at all the bracing I installed to hold the shower walls in place. And in addition to this, I will also add some shims behind some of these boards to make everything as tight as possible. So now at this point, I'll wait about 24 hours for the adhesive to cure, then remove the braces. So when you're dealing with temporary bracing such as this, you really don't want to spend a bunch of time trying to make perfect cuts and making it look good. It really doesn't matter. The only thing you need to worry about is making it functional so it can hold the walls in place while the adhesive cures. 
Now it's time to patch in the drywall around the shower. So I will show a couple different methods here. The shower flanges are about one quarter inch thick, so you can either patch the seam where the drywall meets the flange, which I will show here in a few, or you can shim the wall with one quarter inch shims as shown here. Then the drywall can overlap the flange for a finished look. And here is a closer look at all the quarter inch shims I installed on this wall. Now I will apply some adhesive to all the shims, then glue the drywall in place. And optionally, you could also just use some drywall screws to secure this in place instead of the adhesive. So this method is the preferred way of doing it for most people. But this does require a lot of work because all the drywall has to be removed in order to shim it. The second method involves just leaving the majority of the drywall in place and patching the seams. So right here, you can see I patched the drywall down to the shower wall flanges, then taped off the top of the panels about one quarter inch away from the edges. Now I will use some caulking and apply a couple of very thick beads to the seams and flanges, then use a putty knife to spread the caulking and make it lay flat. And what this will do is create a waterproof gasket between the shower walls and the drywall. And I can also do the same thing for seams between two pieces of drywall as well. But something I would like to mention about this method is that if you don't have a lot of experience with caulking and patching work, this method will probably be pretty difficult. So I would probably skip trying to do something like this without some prior experience. And here's another example from a different angle. So I'm applying a thick bead of caulking to the seam and a bead to the flange as well. Then I'll take my putty knife and smooth it out. So my objective here is to hold the putty knife as flat as possible against the wall to smooth the caulking out and make it even with the surface of the wall. Then after applying all the caulking, I then remove the masking tape and allow it to dry for at least 24 hours. So the masking tape might seem like a tedious step, but by doing it this way, you'll get a nice perfect line once you remove the masking tape. And after waiting 24 hours for everything to dry, I then grab my masking tape and remask all the edges once again. Next, I will use some latex primer and prime all the areas on the walls I just patched. So this will more than likely take a couple coats of primer. And once I'm done, I need to let this fully dry before continuing. So the caulking will most definitely shrink, but it still works good for the beginning stages of this patch. Now I will use some spackling and start applying this with a small putty knife first to the patched areas on the walls, then spread it with a larger putty knife as evenly as possible. And at this point, if you want to, you could also apply some fiberglass drywall seam tape to the seams to make them even stronger. But in my opinion, I don't think it's necessary. And with this same spackling, I also applied some on the ceiling where it was scarred up from when I cut that wall loose earlier. And once I'm done applying the spackling, I'll let it fully dry until it's white in color, which indicates it's dry. Now I will begin sanding the spackling. So I can either dry sand like normal or wet sand as I will show here. So this is a wet drywall sanding sponge that's meant to be soaked in water and wrung out until damp. And this sponge has two sides, one for sanding and one for dampening. So first, I use the sponge side to dampen the areas that were patched with spackling. Then I flip the sponge to the sanding side and begin sanding the spackling. And the objective here is to make the patched wall surface even with the rest of the wall and making sure the edges are feathered as well. And once the sanding side of the sponge starts to become full with spackling, it's time to rinse it out. Then I repeat the same steps until the surface is even with the rest of the wall. So over the years, I've done a lot of dry sanding and wet sanding on dry wall, and my preferred method is wet sanding. And that's mainly because it really cuts down on the amount of dust that is normally produced from standard dry sanding. And now that I'm done sanding, it's time to prime the walls once again. And there's not a whole lot to prime this time around. I'm just trying to prime the areas where the spackling was applied. Then after the primer dries, 
I began prepping the patched areas for wall texturing by masking the edges of the shower further with masking paper, as well as any other areas that I don't want to get texture on, such as the floor and other surrounding walls. To texture these walls, I will just be using a couple cans of Homex Knockdown Wall Texture, which will take at least two to three coats to match the previous wall texture. And the goal here is to try and match the existing texture on the walls, so you may have to adjust the spray pattern on the nozzle until you get the desired texture you are looking for. And if you do happen to have knockdown texture like myself, after spraying and waiting around 20 minutes, you can begin knocking it down. And for anyone out there that does want to learn more about knockdown texture, I do have a video about that that talks about this more in detail, and I'll put a link to that down below in the description. And once all the texturing is done, I will go ahead and remove the masking paper and tape. Then go ahead and get all my trim taken care of, such as my crown trim and baseboard. Then the joints at the top of the shower panels between the sides and back panel can be filled with caulking and smoothed out with a putty knife, then cleaned up with a damp rag. Next, caulking can be applied to all areas where the drywall meets the shower panel that has not already been patched with caulking. And for an optional step, you can also mask once again at the edges to have a perfect straight line. So right here, I'm applying a small bead of caulking, then I'll use my finger and make a pass in both directions and this will fill the joint nicely. And once I'm done applying the caulking, I then remove the tape before it dries, which leaves me with a nice straight line. And once the caulking dries, it's ready for paint. And for another optional step, if you want to, you can mask the edges of the shower again to keep the paint line nice and straight. And since I'm using a paint and primer in one, I don't have to worry about going through the extra step of priming the wall first. I can just use this and be done. And after painting two coats of paint on the walls, I then remove the tape, which leaves me with a nice straight line. And here's a look at the finished patchwork, texture, and paint job around the shower. And then I also painted the cabinet that I modified earlier next to the shower wall, which involved lightly sanding the whole cabinet, then priming it, then painting it. Now it's time to finish the shower drain. So there is two washers, one made of rubber and one made of plastic. And the rubber one sits on top of the plastic one. Now I will place both of these under the shower base and down against the drainage. Then I will use a small amount of rubbing alcohol on a rag and clean the drain area on the shower base. Next, I will apply a thick bead of clear silicone right around the drain opening. And I will also apply a medium sized bead of clear silicone around the inside edge of the top of the drain assembly. Then carefully begin to thread this into the bottom part of the drain. Then after getting it hand tight, you can use a flat blade screwdriver or something similar to tighten it the rest of the way. But don't get too carried away, just get it nice and snug. And when you're tightening this, you'll want to keep in mind that the threaded holes will need to be square with the square edges of the drain opening on the shower base. Otherwise, the drain strainer cover will not fit properly. Now, I will apply an eighth inch layer of clear silicone to the square drain opening on the shower base surrounding the drain. Then place the bottom part of the strainer on top of the drain, which should push into the clear silicone I just applied. And at this point, you can go ahead and start cleaning up any clear silicone that's starting to squeeze out. And next, it's time to install the top piece of the strainer. And this lines up with the two holes on the drain and secures with two screws. And once again, you want to be careful not to over tighten these and just get these snug. And more than likely, after you tighten the strainer, some silicone will squeeze out. So just have a rag handy to start cleaning up the excess silicone. And here's an up close look at the shower drain after finishing. Now the flooring in front of the shower needs to be patched. So I will use a straight edge to make some square cuts on the edges of this vinyl, then remove the cut piece. And since there is two layers of flooring, I will need to patch this bottom layer as well. 
So right here, I have a custom cut piece to fit this area that is the same thickness. And now I will secure this with nails, then patch the seams with a floor leveling compound. So what I'm trying to do here is fill the seams and get this part of the flooring level before I install the vinyl. Then after waiting for this to fully harden, I then began applying some pressure sensitive flooring adhesive that's designed to work with this type of vinyl. So I apply this first with a small putty knife, then spread it with a 1 16th of an inch V-notch trowel as evenly as possible. And I will also lift the edges of the existing vinyl to apply some adhesive under there as well. Next, I need to measure and cut a piece of vinyl with a straight edge to fit this area. And once the adhesive dries to a point where it becomes tacky and somewhat clear, I can install the vinyl. So right here, I'm carefully lining up the edges of the vinyl together while pressing the vinyl down evenly and firmly in place. And since this is just a small patch, I don't really need any special tools. I can just use my hands to press this down in place. But if this was a bigger patch, I would need to use some sort of vinyl roller to secure this in place. Then after getting the vinyl in position, I can clean up any excess adhesive with a damp rag. Now I will remove the protective plastic film on the shower walls to begin installing the shower faucet fixtures. So I will start here with the trim plate, which slides over the valve and secures with two long screws. And you will want to make sure not to over tighten these, just get these snug. Now the temperature adjustment fitting and shower handle adapter can be installed, which installs with one screw. Then the shower faucet handle can be installed, which secures with a small Allen head screw. Next, the shower head arm can be installed, and I will apply some Teflon paste to the threads first, then hand tighten this as much as possible. Then I need to make sure the arm is pointing down, which may require some channel locks to get this in proper position, but you'll want to make sure to place a rag around the arm first to protect it before grabbing it with pliers. Now the trim plate for the shower arm can be installed. Then the shower head, and this has a removable piece on the back they can thread onto the shower arm first to make things a little easier. And this piece here does come with a rubber gasket so there's no need for Teflon paste. And I try to hand tighten this as much as possible and then do about a quarter turn with a wrench. And now this fitting can be threaded onto the back of the shower head. Then the hose for the shower wand can be connected at the bottom of the shower head and the bottom of the shower wand. And both of these fittings were just hand tightened. And here's another look at that magnetic base for the shower wand, which really works well. And now we're on to the next step, which is installing the sliding glass doors. So I will be installing the bottom track first. So I need to measure the distance between the two walls at the bottom right here then minus one eighth of an inch from that measurement, then use this measurement to mark the bottom track and make a cut. Now, this can be placed into position temporarily with the edge being at least five eighths of an inch from the edge of the shower base. Then the side wall jams can be placed on top of the bottom track and up against the walls. And to hold everything in place, masking tape works well. So the objective here is to get the frame in the exact position you want it to be mounted which should be square with your shower walls and base and be at least 5 eighths of an inch from the outside edges of the shower. Then once it's in the position that you like, you can mark it with masking tape at the edges. Then located on the wall jams is three holes on each side that will need to be marked. After marking the six holes, the wall jams can be removed. Then the holes can be drilled with a 1 8 of an inch drill bit. Next, a small amount of rubbing alcohol on the rag can be used to clean the area where the bottom track will be installed. Now, I will use some white silicone and seal the edges of the shower base lip where the bottom track will rest against, and I will do this on both sides. So I'm just applying a small bead of silicone here, then I'll spread that with my finger and wipe off the excess with a rag. Now I will use some clear silicone and apply a bead to the bottom of the track 
on both sides. Then I will carefully place this into position. And if you notice here, I have some masking tape that marks exactly where this should be. Now I will clean the back of the wall jams and the shower wall where the jams will be mounted. Then apply two beads of clear silicone to the back of the wall jams. Then carefully place one of the wall jams in position. Then begin securing it with a screw and a rubber bumper at the top and bottom of the jam. Then located in the middle of the jam is where a plastic guide with a rubber bumper needs to be installed. And now I will do the same thing on the opposite side. So I need to apply the two beads of silicone to the back of the wall jam, then carefully place it in position, then install a rubber bumper at the top and bottom, then install a guide with a bumper in the middle. Next, I need to measure the distance between the shower walls at the top of the jams, then minus 1 16th of an inch from that measurement, then use this measurement to mark and cut the top rail, then place it on top of the wall jams. Now, the wheels can be installed for both doors, and these install fairly easy with just one screw, and the doors have labels on them to indicate the correct side for the rollers, and which side of the door faces out, and there is also multiple mounting holes to adjust the height if needed. And now, the doors are ready to be installed, so you will want to carefully handle the outside door, and tilt it at an angle. Then line up the rollers with the outside track on the top rail. Then let the door slowly swing down, then slide it back and forth to ensure it's on the track. Then I will grab the inside door and carefully place it inside the shower. Then tilt it at an angle and line it up with the tracks on the inside of the top rail. And again I'll slide this back and forth to confirm it is indeed on the track before I let go of the door. Now the door handles can be installed. These have built-in bolts with two plastic washers, one for the inside the glass and one for the outside. To install these, it's super easy. Just place the bolt through the glass with a washer on each side, then thread the bolt into the handle. And to tighten the bolts, the kit does come with a small pin that pushes into a hole on the bolt head, which then allows you to tighten it. But you'll want to make sure to just make these snug and avoid over tightening. And as you can see here, the kit does come with two handles, one for the inside and one for the outside. Now the bottom track guide can be installed, which just slides between the two pieces of glass and secures with two screws. So with this guide, you just need to find the center point for when the doors open and close. Then there is two holes on the front edge of the guide that need to be marked. Then the holes can be drilled with an eighth inch drill bit. Then the guide can be secured with two screws. And now both of these doors open nice and smooth. So per the instructions, there's no screws to secure the top rail, but I decided to go ahead and use a couple self-tapping screws to secure mine to the wall jams to give this frame some extra support. But if you do decide to do this, you'll want to make sure the screws are in an area that does not come in contact with the glass doors. Now I will finally remove the protective plastic film on the shower pan, then clean all the edges inside the shower to prep them to be sealed with silicone. So right here I've applied a thin bead of clear silicone to the inside of the wall jams, and now I'll use my finger to spread this evenly. Then I'll do the same thing with the bottom track. So the instructions call for sealant on the inside and outside edges of the door frame but I personally just seal the inside. Now in regard to the joints on the shower walls, because they already have a gasket that seals the joint between the sides and back wall, no sealant is necessary. But I personally think the joints look better with silicone, so I will go ahead and add a thin bead of white silicone to all the corners in the shower. So not only does it look better having sealant in the corners, but I also think it's easier to keep clean. 
Then, on the outside of the shower, the only other thing I'll be sealing is the joint between the vinyl and the shower base. And here is a quick look at the fully assembled shower. Now I will need to wait approximately 24 hours, then begin a leak test with the shower. Okay, it's been 24 hours, so now I will turn on the water to the shower and leave it running. During the leak test, it's best if you can have someone walk around the shower pan while someone watches from underneath looking at the shower drain and the surrounding areas under the shower to check for any leaks. And luckily with my shower, there is no leaks and everything is good to go. And now I have just one last step. I need to repack all the insulation around the pipes, then repair the insulation wrap with some zip ties. Okay, it's now time for me to go. Hopefully this video will help you out with your own shower remodel. If you like this video, if you could hit that like button and please subscribe and have yourself a great day and I'll see you next time.